Today we have members of, the, of First Parish leading our service, and our focus will be on civil rights. Welcome to the First Parish in Waltham a Unitarian Universalist congregation welcoming all. I wish to extend a special welcome to all of our visitors this morning, especially if you are visiting for the first or second time. We invite you to join us in our common search for human connection and beloved community. We hope you will find what it is we do here on Sunday morning nurturing and welcoming. My name is Jacob Allen. My parents, John Allen and Elise Gittleman, will lead today's service. Our seated minister, the Reverend Mark Fredette, will return next week. Good morning. I'm John Allen. In August, 1963, with the liberal religious youth group of the First Unitarian Church in Baltimore, Maryland, I attended the March on Washington. I had my first taste of soul food. I got to be one of the 250,000 people who heard Dr. Martin Luther King give his famous speech. Others then, some no older than I was, were putting their lives on the line. My wife Elise arranged a vacation in Alabama for our family last year between Christmas and New Year's Day. In this service, we will tell stories from our trip. Elise was inspired to arrange the trip by the Unitarian Universalist Living Legacy Project, which organizes group tours to civil rights sites in the South. But we went on our own because their schedule wouldn't work for us. Please rise now in body or spirit to join us in singing hymn number 153 in the Gray Hymnals, Oh, I Woke Up This Morning. Let's let Todor play it through once before we begin singing.
The flaming chalice, symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith, reminds us of our shared principles. This morning, our chalice will be lit by Marty Ahrens and Gary Madison. In the words of Ida B. Wells, a 19th century activist who worked to expose the horrors of lynching, the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. In the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. We take a moment now to recall the promises which we have bound ourselves in faith, in hope, and in love as we recite the words of our great covenant. Newcomers and guests, the words are printed in the order of service if you would like to read along with us. Love is the spirit of this church, and service its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Please be seated. Let us take a minute to settle in. It is good to be together in this beautiful space, in this time out of time, unplugged with few demands upon us. However you woke up this morning, whatever your mind was stayed on, take this time to rest, to feel, to experience a kind of blessed solitude while in community. We come together in hope and in sorrow connected in the silence, in the singing, and in the listening. Blessed be. Our responsive reading this morning didn't make it into the order of service, but it's number 584. Martin Luther King, Jr. Number 584. I'll read the first part. Please respond with the italicized portion. Are you ready? No. <laughs> Number 584. <laughs> we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice. There are some things in our social system to which all of us ought to be maladjusted. Hatred and bitterness can never cure the disease of fear. Only love can do that. We must evolve for all human conflict a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. The foundation of such a method is love. Before it is too late, we must narrow the gaping chasm between our proclamations of peace and our lowly deeds which precipitate and perpetuate war. One day, we must come to see that peace is not merely the distant goal that we see, but a means by which we arrive at that goal. We must pursue peaceful ends through peaceful means. We shall heal our own despair so Thank you. At some point in your life, probably several times, you may have had a thought along the lines of, at least I, something. I'll let you fill in the blank with whatever you want. 
Your life is going okay. Things aren't as bad as they could be. Perhaps your thought was along the lines of, at least I get to go to coffee hour after the service, or at least the weather isn't bad today. Something that might change, and you're glad it hasn't. Things aren't as bad as they could be. That thought can be dangerous if it's applied to things about oneself or others that do not change. At least I'm tall enough to reach the top shelf so I can hide things that only I can reach. At least I'm not from that side of town. At least I know English as my first language. Thinking along those lines isn't the same as thinking, at least I'm not so sick that I can't get out of bed today. And at least I, about something that doesn't change, is less about how things aren't as bad as they could be. It's more about thinking how someone or something will always be worse than you. It can feel nice to think that sort of thing. It can make you feel a strange mix of anger and happiness, like shoving someone so they fall into a mud puddle and then laughing at them. It's mean. A lot of the time, that sort of at least I isn't even right. Some things change so slowly that you might not notice. And some things don't matter if they never change. If you think, at least I learned to tie my shoes when I was younger than that guy, what does it matter? Both of you can tie your shoes now. It's not like there was a competition and a trophy to win. Maybe you think, at least I like that, because you worry you're not good enough at a different thing. Or maybe you're just having a bad day and want to feel better. Either way, it's okay to ask for help. If you're not good at something, maybe someone who is could show you how to do it better. Maybe they'll ask you to show them how to do something else better. It feels pretty good to have someone ask you to help them like that, because that means they think you're good at it, and you get to feel proud that you helped them afterwards. Much better than sitting around grumbling about how you're good at something and then worrying about everything else, right? Why make comparisons if you can make friends instead? No person is an island, even if they create gulfs between themselves and others. Build bridges. At least then, you'll have a community, a community to support you when you can't do it on your own. Let's join voices now and sing our friendship finders and those choosing Spirit Spark out of the sanctuary. The words are printed in your order of service. gather in this sanctuary to sustain and be sustained by our community of faith, to share, to explore, to celebrate and mourn together. We carry the work of the church beyond these walls as well by offering our gifts of time, treasure, and talent in service to the wider world. To support this church and all of its good work, this morning's offering will now be gratefully received. Will the ushers please come forward to receive the morning offering? Thank you for your generosity. This African American spiritual that we will now hear is inspired by the breakup of enslaved families.
Thank you so much, Bethany and Thea and Jim and Karen. What a gift it is to come here to this spiritual home. Here in this warm and welcoming sanctuary, I invite us to let go of the busyness that distracts us. Let go of the disappointments that hold us hostage. Take a deep breath in and release it slowly. Feel yourself firmly planted in your pew. Know that you are safe in this moment, safe to be still and to let your heart engage with the mystery that surrounds us. Let us be held together in silence as we ready ourselves for prayer. We each come here with our own beliefs. In each of us, there is some understanding of why we are here. In our own way, may we ask for the help we need. May we reach for the strength that is required for the days ahead. May we receive the love that can hold us and carry us through our struggles. May we know that in this moment, we are good enough. May we have faith that we will find what we really need. May we know that we are not here alone. There are others who can help us and others who need us to help them. We see a world where there is inequality and injustice, and hope for a world that can be kinder and more loving. We see a world where there is violence done to people and the environment, and hope for a world where the earth and all of her people are treated with respect and care. Knowing that peace in the world starts with peace in our own hearts, may we live this day and every day with kindness towards ourselves and towards each other. If you have come to church this morning with the name of someone you are concerned for, please offer that name into the brief silence which follows so that we may hold them and you in our hearts. Becky Campbell Hall. Here we go. Emily Klein. Albert Finney. And Ron Miller. For all those names, and for others who go unspoken, we seek the peace and hope of love's connection. May it be so. Amen.
On a somber, <clears throat> gray day, we drove into Selma over the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Named for a former Confederate Brigadier General and Grand Dragon of the Alabama Ku Klux Klan, the name is iconic due to those who stood up against what it represents. On March 7th, 1965, responding to murderous police action against protesters in a nearby community, Nonviolent protesters walked over the bridge only to meet a phalanx of state police and a sheriff's posse on horses, throwing tear gas canisters, cracking skulls with batons, and slashing with horse whips. The news went nationwide. The following evening, Ku Klux Klan members bludgeoned Unitarian Universalist minister Reverend James Reed to death outside a bar in Selma. Dr. King turned back another march the following day rather than face more violence. Two weeks later, following a court order and President Johnson's calling up the National Guard for protection, clergy, famous people, ordinary people, from all around the country joined a 50-mile march to the state capitol in Montgomery. They came facing the possibility of violence and even death. Understand the courage. Times have changed. We had lunch in Selma served by white people, but black people were seated in the same restaurant. They can vote now. The mayor is black. I am grateful for all of that but the sidewalks were nearly empty. Some buildings on the main street have empty window openings. One is only the front wall with an empty lot behind. A thousand once bustling rural centers became ghost towns as a highway bypass has sucked the life out of the downtown and agribusiness replaces family farming. Unlike most, Selma has tourism, but that isn't enough. We saw a few other tourists, too, Asian American, African American, and white. The best looking things in Selma are the monuments to the civil right, rights activists and martyrs. They are splendid. Returning from Selma to Montgomery, on U.S. Route 80, we park next to a small, tidy church. It is on a small plot of land carved out of pasture land. We walked a couple hundred feet up the road to the monument to Unitarian Universalist Viola Liuzzo, where Klansmen shot her dead in a car chase. She left a husband and five children back in Detroit. In the distance, Black Angus beef cattle were grazing as we stood at the monument. The noisy traffic was rushing by. Back home online, I find a quote, the Wright Chapel AME Zion Church is famous for holding many large meetings during the civil rights movement, end quote. I read of the deep poverty in the area, which you don't see from the highway. There is another monument along Route 80, only one and a half miles up the road from Leozzo's. It is to Elmore Bowling, black businessman who was lynched in 1947 for being too successful. We drove right past it, unaware of it till we read about it later. Montgomery. At the bottom of a hill on Dexter Avenue is Court Square where humans were sold at auction. Halfway up the hill is the church at which Dr. King took his first post as settled minister. At the top of the hill stands the state capitol building on whose steps he spoke to the marchers from Selma. There's a marble monument celebrating that speech, but also a statue of 
Jefferson Davis, president of the only country to have been at war with the United States of America from the beginning to end of its existence. And there is a monument to Confederate soldiers with inscriptions praising them in florid language. I'll read one. The knightliest of the knightly race, who since the days of old have kept the lamp of chivalry alight in hearts of gold. Chivalry, honor. Well, let's try to have some empathy for the huge pain of loss of family members who fought and died. Loss of a war, loss of a way of life, maintaining a sense of identity in the face of humiliation may rest on the humiliation, patronization, violence against others. Some people still want to rally around the monument. Others want it to come down. But I find a different message in it. Montgomery's lesson is more powerful through not having been sanitized. We don't live past this tragedy unless we own it. There is much that I love and support about this country, but there was a reign of terror and injustice continues. Many people have led and continue to lead hard and blighted lives, and some gave their lives. And I can't walk, I can't walk straight or talk straight unless I own that. I have led a charmed life by birth, by stepping away from danger, sometimes thanks to privilege, sometimes thanks to caution, and sometimes to dumb luck. In this church, I have learned to be more grateful, but as the shadow of oppression and terror, but the shadow of impression, oppression and terror and wars lingers. As Reverend Marx said a couple of weeks ago, we have only each other and our power of decency and respect. Um, <clears throat> please rise now in body or spirit to join in singing hymn number 151 in the gray hymnals, I Wish I Knew How. Let's
Every year, a highlight of the Unitarian Universalist Association's Grand As uh, General Assembly is the Ware Lecture, given by a distinguished guest. Last summer, in June 2018, as Americans were horrified by the family separations at the Mexican border, black activist Brittany Packnett delivered the Ware Lecture. This morning's reading is an excerpt from this lecture. All week, we have watched fascism and nationalism once again rear its ugly face to tear child from parent and criminalize the very migration that has been a natural part of all human life since the dawn of time. And all week, from well-intentioned people with good hearts and strong souls, all week I have heard us utter a simple phrase, this is not who we are. But this, this is exactly who we are. And those of us whose society has pushed to the margins have been trying to tell you so for years. Indigenous people who occupied this land as far north as Canada and as far south as the very border we want to close down as if they were ours to begin with have been trying to tell you that this is exactly who we are. Native people whose children were kidnapped in the dead of night and shipped off to boarding schools so that a nascent country founded with genocide and on supremacy could, quote, kill the Indian, save the man. They've been trying to tell you this is exactly who we are. The descendants of enslaved Africans watching their children be sold off for labor have been trying to tell you that this is exactly who we are. That when our children were being sold off from us, our women were still expected to breastfeed the children of their owners that there were no tracking systems when their children were taken either, that no one had any intentions of reunifications then either, that no executive orders were signed to truly end their suffering then either, that reconstruction was intentionally stopped then just like immigration reform is now, that every day in America people are tossed in jail for being black and brown and given no hope of pleading for amnesty, Tax cuts for the wealthy, the rating of farm bills that keep children fed, the criminalization poverty, the criminalization of poverty, the environmental racism that has left Flint, Michigan without clean water for thousands of days, the shame heaped upon transgender children who just want to use the bathroom, the Islamophobia that burns mosques, the anti-Semitism that destroys burial grounds, the hatred for the, indigen for the indigenous that carves the faces of oppressive presidents in their sacred hills, the constant degradation of black women and women of color, the economic injustice that predicts Latinx people will have zero wealth in 55 years and black people will have zero wealth in 35 short years. The criminalization of migration and the separation of families are and always have been manifestations of who we are. On our first full day in Alabama, we visited the Legacy Museum and the National Memorial to Peace and Freedom. Both of these had just opened last year and are the work of the Equal Justice Initiative, whose director, Brian Stevenson, gave the Ware Lecture at the Unitarian Universalist Association's General Assembly in 2017. That talk focused on his efforts to advocate for equal just treatment for all in the criminal justice system. Both the museum and the memorial address an even more difficult issue, how deeply entrenched white supremacy is in this country and how the legacy of enslavement birthed the incredible cruelty of lynching, which has led to the current crisis in mass incarceration. The museum and memorial bring these facts to you powerfully in ways that open my heart to the suffering of black people throughout the history of our country. As you enter the museum, 
which is housed in a building that held enslaved people while they were waiting to be sold at Court Square, they were confronted by the overpowering facts about the history of the domestic slave trade and the stories of family separation, which affected about half of the black families. You see video images of people in slave holding cells sharing the cruelty to which they are subjected and the hope to which they cling. You hear singing of songs which overpower all the other voices and drive home the suffering these separations caused. Imagine, if you can, that when the children left the sanctuary today, that is the last their families would ever see of them and that Bethany is one of those forlorn children. We need to remember that this is who we have always been. As you walk through the museum, you learn about the continued cruel treatments that blacks suffered even after emancipation. America still wanted to think of blacks as less than and found numerous ways to treat them as such. And over the last 50 years, we have seen mass incarceration created by the war on drugs, which affects black people disproportionately. There are deeply held and sometimes subtle biases held by all of us that mean in every interaction black people have with police and the criminal justice system, they're in danger of losing their freedom or even their lives for little or no reason. The museum lets you hear the voices of people who are imprisoned in horrific conditions, at times for crimes they didn't commit, often convicted by all white juries, white prosecutors, and white judges. One prisoner says of this system, they take off their white robes and they put on black robes. And I reflected after this visit, I realized that we live in a society where the hate of certain others is so deeply rooted as to be almost invisible to us. How does it feel to know that I am part of the systems that perpetuate this hate and this justified inequality? And I wonder how I am still complicit in these systems. We walked the mile to the memorial from the museum on a bright sunny day to be confronted by the reality of lynching in America. The Equal Justice Initiative has documented evidence of over 4,400 lynchings in the United States and created the memorial to honor these victims. Suspended from the ceiling are 800 court and steel monuments. The court means they weathered to brown. Each is engraved with the names and dates of black people lynched in a particular county. As you walk along, the ground slopes down until the monuments are hanging over you like bodies. Along the walls are some of the crimes that these lynchings punished. Vagrancy, suing a white man who killed your cow allegedly writing a note to a white woman. You can also read how the victims were murdered and the crowds that came to watch. Whole towns, families with children, people posing with the bodies. This is how white people make sure that black people knew their place. And this is who we have always been. I sat on a bench in this memorial and try to imagine which of the Buddhist compassion practices I know would make any sense in this place. I wondered what my compassion would look like, and I cried, just overwhelmed with sorrow. And later I asked myself, what do my tears do? What do my sorrow and the deep pain in my heart mean? What do they change? How is this experience of benefit to me? How can it be of benefit to others? So I decided we should come here today and share with you some of what we saw and what we learned. I'm here to ask you to look deeply with me at who we as a country have been. 
I'm asking you to notice the times that you think, at least I, about people who you see as different. I'm asking you to join me in the hard work of changing the way we see others, in particular black people, so that we may change the ways that we treat all people. I'd like to imagine a future where we could truthfully say about the inhumane treatment of any group, this is no longer who we are. Here are the words carved into the memorial that broke my heart open. For the hanged and beaten. For the shot, drowned and burned. For the tortured, tormented, and terrorized. For those abandoned by the rule of law. We, we will, will remember. remember. In hope, because hopelessness is the enemy of justice. With courage, because peace requires bravery. In persistence, because justice is a constant struggle. With, with faith, faith, because we, we shall, shall overcome. overcome. Please rise now in body or spirit to join in singing hymn number 169 in the gray hymnals, We Shall Overcome. As you are comfortable, we ask you to join hands through the whole sanctuary so that we may feel the spirit of this anthem of the civil rights movement move through us as one body. We will call out the words for each verse so you don't need your hymnal. So give people a minute to tell you. They know, I think we all know so.
I remember the hype leading up to the swearing in of our first African American president. The excitement around it was so infectious that I felt proud even though I was just barely too young to vote. People were saying racism was finally a thing of the past. We had overcome. Ten years later, we live in a dark reflection of those times. The open racism of individuals and institutions is all but impossible to ignore. American racism wasn't gone. It had been pushed out of the public consciousness, and now it pushes back. It had its back against the ropes, and it sprang back and hit us in the gut. We have not overcome. We ignored the fact that people who see whiteness as the central aspect of their identity still fly a flag of rebellion. We can shout at them, tear down their statues, and have them rename their bridges and streets. We can punch Nazis. This only strengthens their resolve. They think they're the good guys, that they must not lose, that they're preserving the natural order or some other justification born from insecurity. It is not enough to tell them they're wrong. They won't listen. We have to show them what's right, that an equal, multi-ethnic society simply works better than an unequal society. We can still overcome and if this is to truly be a land of the free, we must, we must overcome. Thank you. Todor, play us out, please.
Thank you all very much for sharing in our service this morning. Thanks to everyone who helped with this morning's service. Can I ask Bethany and the dancers to stand up so because we were going to clap for them. John and Jacob and I are deeply grateful to Bethany and Thea Anderson and Jim Banta and Karen Klein who uh, did that. I think that was amazing. Um, I also want to acknowledge my late mother, Sandy Cohn, whose adventurous spirit worked in me to inspire this journey we took. Special thanks again to Todor Stono for the support and the music. Newcomers and guests, thanks for being with us. If you haven't already done so, please sign one of the guest books located at the exits or give your information to the person at the welcome table at coffee hour. If you leave us your contact information, we can send you our e-newsletter full of information about the many events going on in this vibrant faith community. And if you're interested, please join us at noon in the Harrington Room for conversation about our trip and what we learned from it. Thank you again. Before we go, I want to just extend I think this was an absolutely amazing service, and I want to thank you.